This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One Recalled to Life. Book One, Chapter One The Period. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, and we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled for ever. It was the year of our Lord, 1,775. Spiritual revelations were conceded to England at that favoured period, as at this. Mrs. Southcott had recently attained her five-and-twentieth blessed birthday, of whom a prophetic private in the lifeguards had heralded the sublime appearance by announcing that arrangements were made for the swallowing up of London and Westminster. Even the Cock Lane ghost had been laid only a round dozen of years, after wrapping out its messages, as the spirits of this very year last past, supernaturally deficient in originality, wrapped out theirs. Mere messages in the earthly order of events had lately come to the English crown and people, from a congress of British subjects in America, which, strange to relate, have proved more important to the human race than any communications yet received through any of the chickens of the Cock Lane brood. France, less favoured on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill, making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself, besides, with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pincers, and his body burned alive, because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honour to a dirty procession of monks which passed within his view at a distance of some fifty or sixty yards. It is likely enough that rooted in the woods of France and Norway there were growing trees, when that sufferer was put to death, already marked by the woodman, fate, to come down and be sawn into boards, to make a certain movable framework, with a sack and a knife in it, terrible in history. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris, there were sheltered from the weather that very day rude carts, bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs, and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer, death, had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. But that woodman and that farmer, though they work unceasingly, work silently, and no one heard them as they went about with muffled tread. The rather forasmuch as to entertain any suspicion that they were awake was to be atheistical and traitorous. In England there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterers' warehouses for security. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light, and, being recognized and challenged by his fellow tradesman, whom he stopped in the character of the captain, gallantly shot him through the head and rode away. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers, and the guard shot three dead, and then got shot himself by the other four, in consequence of the failure of his ammunition, after which the mail was robbed in peace. 
That magnificent potentate, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman, who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London jails fought battles with their turnkeys, and the majesty of the law fired blunderbusses in among them, loaded with rounds of shot and ball. Thieves snipped off diamond crosses from the necks of noble lords at court drawing-rooms. Musketeers went into St. Giles to search for contraband goods, and the mob fired on the musketeers, and the musketeers fired on the mob, and nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. In the midst of them, the hangman, ever busy and ever worse than useless, was in constant requisition. Now, stringing up long rows of miscellaneous criminals— now hanging a housebreaker on Saturday, who had been taken on Tuesday, now burning people in the hand at Newgate by the dozen, and now burning pamphlets at the door of Westminster Hall, today taking the life of an atrocious murderer, and tomorrow of a wretched pilferer who had robbed a farmer's boy of sixpence. All these things, and a thousand like them, came to pass, in and close, upon the dear old year 1,775. Environed by them, while the woodman and the farmer worked unheeded, those two of the large jaws, and those other two of the plain and fair faces, trod with stir enough, and carried their divine rights with a high hand. Thus did the year 1,775 conduct their greatnesses, and myriads of small creatures, the creatures of this chronicle among the rest, along the roads that lay before them. End of Book One Chapter One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. A Tale of Two Cities. By Charles Dickens. Book One. Chapter Two. The Mail. It was the Dover Road that lay, on a Friday night late in November, before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. The Dover Road lay, as to him, beyond the Dover Mail, as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked up hill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise, under the circumstances, but because the hill, and the harness, and the mud, and the mail, were all so heavy, that the horses had three times already come to a stop, besides once drawing the coach across the road, with the mutinous intent of taking it back to Blackheath. Reins and whip and coachman and guard, however, in combination, had read that article of war which forbade a purpose otherwise strongly in favour of the argument, that some brute animals are endued with reason, and the team had capitulated and returned to their duty. With drooping heads and tremulous tails they mashed their way through the thick mud, floundering and stumbling between whiles, as if they were falling to pieces at the larger joints. As often as the driver rested them, and brought them to a stand, with a wary, "'Wo ho! So ho, then!' the near-leader violently shook his head and everything upon it, like an unusually emphatic horse, denying that the coach could be got up the hill. Whenever the leader made this rattle, the passenger started, as a nervous passenger might, and was disturbed in mind." There was a steaming mist in all the hollows, and it had roamed in its forlornness up the hill, like an evil spirit, seeking rest and finding none. A clammy and intensely cold mist, it made its slow way through the air in ripples that visibly followed and overspread one another, as the waves of an unwholesome sea might do. It was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach-lamps but these its own workings, and a few yards of road, and the reek of the labouring horses steamed into it, as if they had made it all. 
Two other passengers, besides the one, were plodding up the hill by the side of the mail. All three were wrapped to the cheekbones and over the ears, and wore jack-boots. Not one of the three could have said, from anything he saw, what either of the other two was like, and each was hidden under almost as many wrappers from the eyes of the mind as from the eyes of the body of his two companions. In those days travellers were very shy of being confidential on a short notice, for anybody on the road might be a robber, or in league with robbers. As to the latter, when every posting-house and ale-house could produce somebody in the captain's pay, ranging from the landlord to the lowest stable nondescript, it was the likeliest thing upon the cards. So the guard of the Dover Mail thought to himself, that Friday night in November, one thousand seven hundred and seventy-five, lumbering up Shooter's Hill, as he stood on his own particular perch behind the mail, beating his feet and keeping an eye and a hand on the arm-chest before him, where a loaded blunderbuss lay at the top of six or eight loaded horse-pistols, deposited on a substratum of cutlass. The Dover mail was in its usual genial position that the guard suspected the passengers, the passengers suspected one another and the guard, they all suspected everybody else, and the coachman was sure of nothing but the horses. As to which cattle he could with a clear conscience have taken his oath on the two testaments that they were not fit for the journey. Woho! said the coachman. So then, one more pull, and you're at the top and be damned to you, for I have had trouble enough to get you to it. Joe! Hello! the guard replied. What o'clock do you make it, Joe? Ten minutes, good, past eleven. "'My blood!' ejaculated the vexed coachman. "'And not a top of shooters yet. "'Tss! Yah! Get on with you!' The emphatic horse, cut short by the whip in a most decided negative, made a decided scramble for it, and the three other horses followed suit. Once more the Dover mail struggled on, with the jack-boots of its passengers squashing along by its side. They had stopped when the coach stopped, and they kept close company with it. If any one of the three had had the hardihood to propose to another to walk on a little ahead into the mist and darkness, he would have put himself in a fair way of getting shot instantly, as a highwayman. The last burst carried the mail to the summit of the hill. The horses stopped to breathe again, and the guard got down to skid the wheel for the descent, and open the coach-door, to let the passengers in. "'Tss! Joe!' cried the coachman, in a warning voice, looking down from his box. "'What do you say, Tom?' They both listened. "'I say, a horse at a canter coming up, Joe.' "'I say, a horse at a gallop, Tom,' returned the guard, leaving his hold of the door, and mounting nimbly to his place. "'Gentlemen, in the King's name, all of you!' With this hurried adjuration he cocked his blunderbuss, and stood on the offensive. The passenger booked by this history was on the coach-step, getting in. The two other passengers were close behind him, and about to follow. He remained on the step, half in the coach, and half out of it. They remained in the road below him. They all looked from the coachman to the guard, and from the guard to the coachman, and listened. The coachman looked back, and the guard looked back, and even the emphatic leader pricked up his ears and looked back, without contradicting. The stillness consequent on the cessation of the rumbling and labouring of the coach, added to the stillness of the night, made it very quiet indeed. The panting of the horses communicated a tremulous motion to the coach, as if it were in a state of agitation. The hearts of the passengers beat loud enough, perhaps, to be heard, but at any rate the quiet pause was audibly expressive of people out of breath, and holding the breath, and having the pulses quickened by expectation. The sound of a horse at a gallop came fast and furiously up the hill. "'So ho!' the guard sang out, as loud as he could roar. "'Yo there! Stand! I shall fire!' 
the pace was suddenly checked, and, with much splashing and floundering, a man's voice called from the mist, "'Is that the Dover Mail?' "'Never you mind what it is,' the guard retorted. "'What are you?' "'Is that the Dover Mail?' "'Why do you want to know?' "'I want a passenger, if it is.' "'What passenger?' "'Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Our booked passenger showed in a moment that it was his name. The guard, the coachman, and the two other passengers eyed him distrustfully. "'Keep where you are,' the guard called to the voice in the mist, "'because, if I should make a mistake, it could never be set right in your lifetime. "'Gentlemen of the name of Lorry, answer straight.' "'What is the matter?' asked the passenger then, with mildly quavering speech. "'Who wants me? Is it Jerry?' "'I don't like Jerry's voice, if it is Jerry,' growled the guard to himself. "'He's hoarser than suits me, is Jerry.' "'Yes, Mr. Lorry.' "'What is the matter?' "'A despatch sent after you from over yonder. Tea and company.' "'I know this messenger guard,' said Mr. Lorry, getting down into the road, assisted from behind more swiftly than politely by the other two passengers, who immediately scrambled into the coach, shut the door, and pulled up the window. "'He may come close. There's nothing wrong.' "'I hope there ain't, but I can't make so nation sure of that,' said the guard, in gruff soliloquy. "'Hallo, you!' "'Well, and hallo, you!' said Jerry, more hoarsely than before. "'Come on at a foot-pace, do you mind me? And if you've got holsters to that saddle yorn, don't let me see your hand go nigh em, for I'm a devil at a quick mistake, and when I make one it takes the form of lead. So now let's look at you.' The figures of a horse and rider came slowly through the eddying mist, and came to the side of the mail, where the passenger stood. The rider stooped, and, casting up his eyes at the guard, handed the passenger a small folded paper. The rider's horse was blown, and both horse and rider were covered with mud, from the hoofs of the horse to the hat of the man. "'Guard,' said the passenger, in a tone of quiet business confidence. The watchful guard, with his right hand at the stock of his raised blunderbuss, his left at the barrel, and his eye on the horseman, answered curtly, "'Sir?' "'There is nothing to apprehend. I belong to Tellson's Bank. You must know Tellson's Bank in London. I am going to Paris on business. A crown to drink. May I read this?' "'If so be as you're quick, sir.' He opened it in the light of the coach-lamp on that side, and read, first to himself, and then aloud, "'Wait at Dover for Mamselle. "'It's not long, you see, guard. "'Jerry, say that my answer was, "'Recalled to life.' "'Jerry started in his saddle. "'That's a blazing strange answer, too,' said he, at his horsest. "'Take that message back, and they will know that I received this, "'as well as if I wrote. "'Make the best of your way. Good night.' With those words the passenger opened the coach-door and got in, not at all assisted by his fellow-passengers, who had expeditiously secreted their watches and purses in their boots, and were now making a general pretense of being asleep. With no more definite purpose than to escape the hazard of originating any other kind of action. The coach lumbered on again, with heavier wreaths of mist closing round it as it began the descent. The guard soon replaced his blunderbuss in his arm-chest, and, having looked to the rest of its contents, and having looked to the supplementary pistols that he wore in his belt, looked to a smaller chest beneath his seat, in which there were a few smith's tools, a couple of torches, and a tinder-box for he was furnished with that completeness that if the coach-lamps had been blown and stormed out, which did occasionally happen, he had only to shut himself up inside, 
keep the flint and steel sparks well off the straw, and get a light with tolerable safety and ease, if he were lucky, in five minutes. Tom! Softly over the coach roof. Hello, Joe. Did you hear the message? I did, Joe. What did you make of it, Tom? Nothing at all, Joe. That's a coincidence, too, the guard mused, for I made the same of it myself. Jerry, left alone in the mist and darkness, dismounted meanwhile, not only to ease his spent horse, but to wipe the mud from his face and shake the wet out of his hat-brim, which might be capable of holding about half a gallon. After standing with the bridle over his heavily splashed arm, until the wheels of the mail were no longer within hearing, and the night was quite still again, he turned to walk down the hill. "'After that there gallop from Temple Bar, old lady, I won't trust your forelegs till I get you on the level,' said this hoarse messenger, glancing at his mare. "'Recalled to life. That's a blazing strange message. Much of that wouldn't do for you, Jerry. I say, Jerry, you'd be in a blazing bad way, if recalling to life was to come into fashion, Jerry.' End of Book One, Chapter Two, The Mail, read by Kara Schallenberg, on January eleventh, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 11, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Chapter 3. The Night Shadows. A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration, when I enter a great city by night, that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room in every one of them encloses its own secret, that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imaginings, a secret to the heart nearest it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. No more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depths of the unfathomable water, wherein, as momentary lights glanced into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should shut with a spring for ever and for ever when I had read but a page. It was appointed that the water should be locked in an eternal frost when the light was playing on its surface and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead, my neighbor is dead, my love, the darling of my soul is dead. It is the inexorable consolation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality. Burial places of this city through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their inmost personality to me or than I to them? As to this, his natural and not-to-be-alienated inheritance, the messenger on horseback had exactly the same possessions as the king, the first minister of state, or the richest merchant in London. So, with the three passengers shut up in the narrow compasses of one lumbering old mail-coach, they were mysteries to one another, as complete as if each had been in his own coach and six, or his own coach and sixty, with the breadth of a county between him and the next. 
The messenger rode back at an easy trot, stopping pretty often at alehouses by the way to drink, but evincing a tendency to keep his own counsel, and to keep his hat cocked over his eyes. He had eyes that assorted very well with that decoration, being of a surface black with no depth in the color or form, and much too near together, as if they were afraid of being found out in something, singly if they were kept too far apart. They had a sinister expression under an old cocked hat like a three-cornered spittoon, and over a great muffler for the chin and throat which descended nearly to the wearer's knees. When he stopped for a drink, he moved this muffler with his left hand, only while he poured his liquor in with his right. As soon as that was done, he muffled again. "'No, Jerry, no!' said the messenger, harping on one theme as he rode. "'It wouldn't do for you, Jerry. Jerry, you're an honest tradesman. It wouldn't suit your line of business. Recall, bust me if I don't think he'd been a-drinkin'.' His message perplexed his mind to that degree that he was fain, several times, to take off his hat and scratch his head. Except on the crown, which was raggedly bald, he had stiff black hair standing jaggedly all over it, and growing downhill almost to his broad, blunt nose. It was so like Smith's work, so much like the top of a strongly spiked wall than a head of hair that the best of players at leapfrog might have declined him as the most dangerous man in the world to go over. While he trotted back with the message he was to deliver to the night watchman in his box at the door of Tellison's bank by Temple Bar, who was to deliver it to greater authorities within, the shadows of the night took such shapes to him as arose out of the message, and took such shapes to the mare as he arose out of her private topics of uneasiness. They seemed to be numerous, for she shied at every shadow on the road. What time the mail coach lumbered, jolted, rattled, and bumped upon its tedious way with its three fellow inscrutables inside, to whom, likewise, the shadows of the night revealed themselves in the form of their dozing eyes and wandering thoughts suggested. Telson's bank had run upon it in the mail, as the bank passenger, with an arm drawn through the leathern strap, which did what lay in it to keep him from pounding against the next passenger and driving him into the corner, whenever the coach got a special jolt, nodded in his place with half-shut eyes, the little coach windows and the coach lamp dimly gleaming through them, and the bulky bundle of opposite passenger became the bank, and did a great stroke of business. The rattle of the harness was the chink of money. The more drafts were honored in five minutes than even Telson's, with all its foreign and home connection, ever paid in thrice the time. Then the strong rooms underground at Telson's with such of their valuable stores and secrets as were known to the passenger, and it was not the little that he knew of them, opened before him, and he went in among them with the great keys and the feebly burning candle, and found them safe and strong and sound and still, just as he had last seen them. But, though the bank was almost always with him, and though the coach, in a confused way like the presence of pain under an opiate, was always with him, there was another current of thought that never ceased to run all through the night. He was on his way to dig someone out of a grave. Now, with much of the multitude of faces that showed themselves before him was the true face of the buried person. The shadows of the night did not indicate, but they were all the faces of a man of five and forty by years, and they differed principally in the passions they expressed, and in the ghastliness of their worn and wasted state. Pride, contempt, defiance, stubbornness, submission— lamentation succeeded one another, and did varieties of sunken cheek, cadaverous color, emaciated eyes and figures. 
but the face was in the main one face, and every head was prematurely white. A hundred times the dozing passenger inquired of this specter, Buried how long? The answer was always the same, almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out long ago. You knew that you were recalled to life? They tell me so. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Shall I show her to you? Will you come and see her? The answers to this question were various and contradictory. Sometimes the broken reply was, Wait, it would kill me if I saw her too soon. Sometimes it was given in a tender rain of tears, and then it was, Take me to her. Sometimes it was staring and bewildered, and then it was, I don't know her. I don't understand. After such imaginary discourse, the passenger in his fancy would dig and dig and dig, now with a spade, now with a great key, now with his hands to dig this wretched creature out. Got on at last with earth hanging about his face and hair, he would suddenly fan away to dust. The passenger would then start to himself and lower the window to get the reality of mist and rain on his cheek. Yet even when his eyes were opened on the mist and the rain, on that moving patch of light from the lamps and the hedge at the roadside retreating by jerks, the night shadows outside the coach would fall into the train of the night shadows within. The real banking house by Temple Bar, the real business of the past day, the real strong rooms, the real express sent after him, and the real message returned would all be there. Out of the midst of them the ghostly face would rise, and he would accost it again. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. I hope you care to live. I cannot say. Dig, 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 until an impatient movement from one of the two passengers would admonish him to pull up the window, draw his arms securely through the leathern strap, and speculate upon the two slumbering forms, until his mind lost its hold of them, and they again slid away into the bank and the grave. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out? Long ago. The words were still in his hearing as just spoken, distinctly in his hearing as ever spoken words had been in his life, when the weary passenger started to the consciousness of daylight, and found that the shadows of night were gone. He lowered the window, and looked out at the rising sun. There was a ridge of ploughed land with a plough upon it, where it had been left last night when the horses were unyoked beyond a quiet coppice wood, in which many leaves of burning red and golden yellow still remained upon the trees. Though the earth was cold and wet, the sky was clear, and the sun rose, bright, placid, and beautiful. Eighteen years, said the passenger, looking at the sun. Gracious creator of day, to be buried alive for eighteen years. Thus ends Chapter 3, The Night Shadows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January eleventh, two 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. CHAPTER Four, THE PREPARATION When the mail got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony, for a mail journey from London in winter was an achievement to congratulate an adventurous traveller upon. 
By that time there was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated, for the other two had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. The mildewy inside of the coach, with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell, and its obscurity, was rather like a larger dog kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat, and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. "'There will be a packet to Calais to-morrow, drawer?' "'Yes, sir, if the weather holds, and the wind sets tolerable fair. The tide'll serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed until night, but I want a bedroom, and a barber.' "'And then breakfast, sir. Yes, sir. That way, sir, if you please. Show Concord. Gentlemen's valise are not wanted to Concord. Pull off the gentlemen's boots in Concord. You'll find a fine sea-coal fire, sir. Fetch barber to Concord. Stir about there now for Concord.' The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail, and passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot, the room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George that, although but one kind of man was seen to go into it, all kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady were all loitering, by accident, at various points of the road between the Concord and the coffee-room, when a gentleman of sixty, formerly dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn, but very well kept, with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets, passed along on his way to his breakfast. The coffee-room had no other occupant that forenoon other than the gentleman in brown. His breakfast-table was drawn before the fire, and he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal. He sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat, as though it pitted its gravity and longevity against the levity and evanescence of the brisk fire. He had a good leg, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close, and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles, too, though plain, were trim. He wore an odd little sleek, crisp, flaxen wig, setting very close to his head, which wig, it is to be presumed, was made of hair, but which looked far more as though it were spun from filaments of silk or glass. His linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke upon the neighboring beach or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far out at sea. A face habitually suppressed and quieted was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist bright eyes that it must have cost their owner in years gone by some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. He had a healthy color in his cheeks and his face, though lined, bore few traces of anxiety, but perhaps the confidential bachelor clerks in Telson's bank were principally occupied with the cares of other people, and perhaps second-hand cares, like second-hand clothes, came easily off and on. Completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, "'I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time to-day. She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Telson's Bank. Please to let me know.' "'Yes, sir. Telson's Bank in London, sir?' "'Yes. Yes, sir. We oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir.' A vast dealing of travelling, sir, in Telson and Company's house. Yes, we are quite a French house, as well as an English one. Yes, sir. Not much in the habit of travelling yourself, I think, sir. Not in late years. It is fifteen years since we, well, since I came last from France. Indeed, sir. I was before my time here, sir. 
before our people's time here, sir. The George was in other hands at that time, sir. I believe so. But I could hold a pretty wager, sir, that a house like Telson and Company was flourishing a matter of fifty, not to speak of fifteen years ago. You might say treble that, and say a hundred and fifty, and yet not be far from the truth. Indeed, sir! Rounding his mouth and both his eyes, as he stepped backward from the table, the waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left, dropped into a comfortable attitude, and stood surveying the guest while he ate and drank, as from an observatory or watchtower, according to the immemorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little, narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town and thundered at the cliffs and brought the coast down madly. The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavor that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped into it, as sick people went down to be dipped into the sea. A little fishing was done in the port, and a quantity of strolling about by night and looking seaward, particularly at that times when the tide made and was near flood. Small tradesmen, who did no business whatever, sometimes unaccountably realized large fortunes, and it was remarkable that nobody in the neighborhood could endure a lamplighter. As the day declined into the afternoon and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapor, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark and he sat before the coffee-room fire awaiting his dinner as he had awaited his breakfast, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. A bottle of good claret after dinner does a digger in the red coals no harm, otherwise then, as it has a tendency to throw him out of work. Mr. Lorry had been idle a long time and had just poured out his last glassful of wine with as complete an appearance of satisfaction as is ever to be found in an elderly gentleman of a fresh complexion who has got to the end of a bottle, when a rattling of wheels came up the narrow street and rumbled into the inn-yard. He set down his glass untouched. "'This is Mademoiselle,' said he. In a very few minutes the waiter came in to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Telson's. So soon. Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then, and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Telson's immediately, if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Telson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation settle his odd little flaxen wig at his ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horsehair and loaded with heavy, dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany, and no light to speak of could be expected from them until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be, for the moment, in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles he saw, standing to receive him by the table between him and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding-cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, 
a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and the forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of rifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, or merely a bright fixed attention, though it included all four expressions. As his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him, of a child whom he had held in his arms on a passage across that very channel one cold time, when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high. The likeness passed away, like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier-glass behind her, on the frame which a hospital procession of negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender, and he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. "'Pray take a seat, sir,' in a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed. "'I kiss your hand, miss,' said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again, and took his seat. "'I received a letter from the bank, sir, yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery—the word is not material, miss, either word will do—respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead—' Mr. Lorry moved in his chair and cast a troubled look toward the hospital procession of negro cupids, as if they had any help for anybody in their absurd baskets. Rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with the gentleman of the bank so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. As I was prepared to hear, sir. She curtsied to him. Young ladies made curtsies these days with a pretty desire to convey to him that she felt how much older and wiser he was than she. He made her another bow. I replied to the bank, sir, that it was considered necessary by those who know that, and who are so kind as to advise me, that I should go to France, and that as I am an orphan and have no friend who could go with me, I should esteem it highly if I might be permitted to place myself during the journey under that worthy gentleman's protection. The gentleman had left London, but I think a messenger was sent after him to beg the favour of his waiting for me here. I was happy, said Mr. Lorry, to be entrusted with the charge. I shall be more happy to execute it. Sir, I thank you indeed. I thank you very gratefully. It was told me by the bank that the gentleman would explain to me the details of the business, and that I must prepare myself to find them of a surprising nature. I have done my best to prepare myself, and I naturally have a strong and eager interest to know what they are. Naturally, said Mr. Lorry. Yes, I... After a pause he added, again settling his crisp flaxen wig at the ears, It is very difficult to begin. He did not begin, but in his indecision met her glance. The young forehead lifted itself into that singular expression, but it was pretty and uncharacteristic besides being singular, and she raised her hand as if with some involuntary action she caught at or stayed some passing shadow. "'Are you quite a stranger to me, sir?' Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. Between the eyebrows and just over the little feminine nose, the line of which was as delicate and fine as it could possibly be, the expression deepened itself as she took her seat thoughtfully in the chair by which she had thitherto remained standing. He watched her as she mused, and the moment she raised her eye again, went on. In your adopted country, I presume, I cannot do better than address you as a young English lady, Miss Manette? If you please, sir. 
Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to equip myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I were a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated, when he added, in a hurry, Yes, customers. In the banking business we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, a man of great acquirements, a doctor. Not of Beauvais. Why, yes, of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honor of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was at that time in our French house, and had been, oh, twenty years. At this time, may I ask, at, at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married, an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Telson's hands. In a similar way, I am, or have been, trustee of one or another to scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I have no feelings. I am a mere machine. To go on. But this is my father's story, sir, and I begin to think— The curiously roughened forehead was very intent upon him. That when I was left an orphan, through my mother's surviving my father only two years, it was you who brought me to England. I am almost sure it was you. Mr. Lorry took the hesitating little hand that confidently advanced to take his, and he put it with some ceremony to his lips. He then conducted the young lady straight away to the chair again, and, holding the chair back with his left hand, and using his right by turns to rub his chin, pull his wig at the ears, or point what he said stood looking down into her face, while she sat looking up into his. Miss Manette, it was I. And you will see how truly I spoke of myself just now in saying I had no feelings, that all the relationship I hold with my fellow creatures are mere business relations, when you reflect that I have never seen you since. No, you have been a ward of Telson's house since, and I have been busy with the other business of Telson's house since. Feelings? I have no time for them, no chance of them. I pass my whole life, miss, in turning an immense pecuniary mangle. After this odd description of his daily routine of employment, Mr. Lorry flattened his flaxen wig upon his head with both hands which was most unnecessary, for nothing could be flatter than its shining surface was before, and resumed his former attitude. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. Now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did, don't be frightened. How you start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrists with both her hands. Pray, said Mr. Lorry in a soothing tone, bringing his left hand from back of the chair to lay it upon the supplicatory fingers that clasped him in so violent a tremble, pray control your agitation. A matter of business. As I was saying, her look so decomposed him that he stopped, wandered, and began anew. As I was saying, if Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had not suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had not been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy and some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I in my own time have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, 
for instance, the privilege of filling up blank forms for the consignment of any one to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time. If his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then the history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. Can you bear it? I can bear anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. You speak collectedly. And you are collected, that's good, though his manner was less satisfied than his words. A matter of business. Regard it as a matter of business. Business that must be done. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensively from this cause before her little child was born, the little child was a daughter, sir. A daughter. A, a matter of business. Don't be distressed, miss. If the poor lady had suffered so intently before her little child was born, that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of, by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead, no, don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? For the truth, oh dear, good, compassionate sir, for the truth. Ah, a matter of business. You confuse me, and how can I transact business if I am confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times nine pence are, or how many shillings and twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Without directly answering to this appeal, she sat so still then that, when he had gently raised her, and the hands that had not ceased to clasp his wrists were so much more steady than they had been, that she communicated some reassurance to Mr. Jarvis Lorry. That's right, that's right. Courage, business. You have business before you, useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty where your father soon wore his heart out in prison, or wasted there through many lingering years. As he said the words, he looked down with an admiring pity on the flowing golden hair, as if he pictured to himself that it might have been already tinged with grey. You know that your parents had no great possession, and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or any other property, but— He felt his wrist held closer and he stopped. The expression in the forehead which had so particularly attracted his notice, and which was now immovable, had deepened into one of pain and horror. But he has been, been found. He is alive, greatly changed. It is too probable, almost a wreck. It is possible though we will hope the best, still alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there, I, to identify him, if I can, you to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his she said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she were saying it in a dream, I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him. Mr. Lorry quietly chafed the hands that held his arm. There, 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 see now, see now. The best and the worst are known to you now. You are well on your way to the poor wronged gentleman, and, with a fair sea voyage and a fair land journey, you will soon be at his dear side. 
She repeated in the same tone, sunk to a whisper, I have been free. I have been happy, yet this ghost has never haunted me. Only one thing more, said Mr. Lorry, laying stress upon it as a wholesome means of enforcing her attentions. He has been found under another name, his own long forgotten or long concealed. It would be worse than useless now to inquire which, worse than useless to seek to know whether he has been for years overlooked or always designedly held prisoner. It would be worse than useless now to make any inquiries, because it would be dangerous. Better not to mention the subject, anywhere or in any way, and to remove him, for a while at all events, out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman, and even Telson's, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. My credentials, entries, and memoranda are all comprehended in the one line, Recalled to life, which may mean anything. But what is the matter? She doesn't notice a word. Miss Manette! Perfectly still and silent, not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand, utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if were carved or branded on her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. A wild-looking woman, whom even in his agitation Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red color, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinarily tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet, like a grenadier wooden measure, and good measure, too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inn-servants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. "'I really think this must be a man,' was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming up against the wall. "'Why, look at you all!' bawled this figure, addressing the inn-servants. Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? I am not so much to look at, am I? Why not you go and fetch the thing? I'll let you know if you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar. Quick, I will. There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, and she softly laid the patient on a sofa, and tended her with great skill and gentleness, calling her, My precious, and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. "'And you in brown,' she said indignantly, turning to Mr. Lorry. "'Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her, with a pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker?' Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer, that he could only look on, at a distance, with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn-servants under the mysterious penalty of letting them know, something not mentioned if they stayed there, staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations, and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. "'I hope she will be well now,' said Mr. Lorry. No thanks to you in brown, if she does, my darling pretty. I hope, said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the young woman. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot up on an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. Thus ends Chapter 4, The Preparation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One, Chapter Five, The Wine Shop. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street, pointing every way, and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men knelt down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped, or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware, or even with handkerchiefs from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers-on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lee-dyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moister wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. There was no drainage to carry off the wine, and not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it, that there might have been a scavenger in the street, if anyone acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. A shrill sound of laughter, and of amused voices, voices of men, women, and children, resounded in the street while this wine-game lasted. There was little roughness in it, in the sport, and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of every one to join some other one, which led, especially among the luckier or lighter-hearted, to frolicsome embraces, drinking of healths, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands, and dancing a dozen together. When the wine was gone, and the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers, these demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman, who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes, at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes, or those of her child, returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks, and cadaverous faces, who had emerged into the winter light from cellars, moved away to descend again, and a gloom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. The wine was red wine and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of St. Antoine in Paris, where it was spilled. It had stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, and many wooden shoes. The hands of the man who sawed the wood left red marks on the billets, and the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head again. Those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth, and one tall joker, so besmirched, his head more out of a long, squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lees. Blood! The time was to come when that wine, too, would be spilt on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many there. And now that the cloud had settled on St. Antoine, which a momentary gleam had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy. Cold, dirt, sickness, ignorance, and want were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence, nobles of great power, all of them, but most especially the last. Samples of a people that had undergone a terrible grinding and regrinding in the mill, and certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner, passed in and out of every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook. The mill which had worked them down was the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces and grave voices, 
and upon them, and upon the grown faces, and ploughed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh, was the sign, Hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses, in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys, and started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its refuse of anything to eat. Hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread, at the sausage shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turned cylinder. Hunger was shred into atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato, fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was in all things fitted to it, a narrow winding street full of offence and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and nightcaps, and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked ill. In the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips, white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows rope they mused about enduring, or inflicting. The trade signs, and they were almost as many as the shops, were all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the porkman painted up only the leanest scrags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meagre loaves. The people, rudely pictured as drinking in the wine-shops, croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer, and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition, save tools and weapons. But the cutler's knives and axes were sharp and bright, the smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways, but broke off abruptly at the doors. The kennel, to make amends, ran down the middle of the street, when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran, by many eccentric fits, into the houses. Across the streets at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley, at night, when the lamplighter had let these down and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed they were at sea, and the ship and the crew were in peril of tempest. For the time was to come when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method, and hauling up men by those ropes and pulleys, to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the birds, fine of song and feather, took no warning. The wine-shop was a corner-shop, better than most others in its appearance and degree, and the master of the wine-shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. "'It's not my affair,' said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders. "'The people from the market did it. Let them bring another.' There his eyes happened to catch the tall joker writing up his joke, so he called to him across the way. "'Say then, my Gaspard, what do you do there?' The fellow pointed to his joke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe, too. "'What now? Are you a subject for the mad hospital?' said the wine-shopkeeper, crossing the road and obliterating the jest with a handful of mud, picked up for the purpose, and smeared over it. "'Why do you write in the public streets? Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in?' In his expostulation he dropped his cleaner hand, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not upon the joker's heart. The joker wrapped it with his own, took a nimble spring upward, and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude. 
with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot into his hand and held out. A joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly, practical character, he looked under those circumstances. "'Put it on, put it on,' said the other. "'Call wine, wine, and finish there.' With that advice he wiped his soiled hand upon the joker's dress, such as it was, quite deliberately, as having dirtied the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine-shop. The wine-shop-keeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of thirty, and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder, his shirt-sleeves were rolled up, too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short dark hair. He was a dark man altogether, with good eyes and a good bold breadth between them. Good-humoured looking on the whole, but implacable looking, too. Evidently a man of strong resolution and a set purpose a man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side, for nothing would turn the man. Madame Defarge, his wife, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything, a large hand heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. There was a character about Madame Defarge, from which one might have predicated that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur, and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not to the concealment of her large earrings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged, with her right elbow supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed just one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of a line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look round the shop among the customers, for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine-shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady, who were seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, "'This is our man.' "'What the devil do you do in that gallery there?' said Monsieur Defarge to himself. "'I don't know you.' But he feigned not to notice the two strangers, and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. "'How goes it, Jacques?' said one of these three to Monsieur Defarge. "'Is all the spilt wine swallowed?' "'Every drop, Jacques,' answered Monsieur Defarge. When this interchange of Christian names was effected, Madame Defarge, picking her teeth with her toothpick, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. "'It is not often,' said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Defarge, "'that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine, or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jacques?' "'It is so, Jacques,' Monsieur Defarge returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name, Madame Defarge, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say, as he put down his empty drinking-vessel, and smacked his lips. "'Ah, so much the worse! A bitter taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths, and hard lives they live, Jacques. Am I right, Jacques?' "'You are right, Jacques.' was the response of Monsieur Defarge. The third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Defarge put her toothpick by, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. "'Hold, then, true,' muttered her husband. "'Gentlemen, my wife.' The three customers pulled off their hats to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. She acknowledged their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner round the wine-shop, 
took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. "'Gentlemen,' said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her, "'good day. The chamber, furnished bachelor fashion, that you wished to see and were inquiring for when I stepped out, is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on to the little courtyard close to the left here.' pointing with his hand, near to the window of my establishment. But now that I remember, one of you has already been there, and can show the way. Gentlemen, adieu. They paid for their wine, and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge were studying his wife at her knitting, when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner, and begged the favour of a word. Willingly, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. Almost at the first word, M. Defarge started, and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute, when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows, and saw nothing. Mr. Jarvis Lorry and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine-shop thus, joined M. Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard, and was the general public entrance to a great pile of houses, inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile-paved entry to the gloomy tile-paved staircase, M. Defarge bent down on one knee to the child of his old master, and put her hand to his lips. It was a gentle action but not at all gently done. A very remarkable transformation had come over him in a few seconds. He had no good humour in his face, nor any openness of aspect left, but had become a secret, angry, dangerous man. It is very high. It is a little difficult. Better to begin slowly. Thus M. Defarge, in a stern voice to Mr. Lorry, as they began ascending the stairs. "'Is he alone?' the latter whispered. "'Alone? God help him who should be with him,' said the other, in the same low voice. "'Is he always alone, then?' "'Yes. Of his own desire?' "'Of his own necessity. As he was when I first saw him after they found me, and demanded to know if I would take him, and that my peril be discreet. As he was then, so he is now. "'He is greatly changed?' "'Changed.' The keeper of the wine-shop stopped to strike the wall with his hand, and mutter a tremendous curse. No direct answer could have been half so forcible. Mr. Lorry's spirits grew heavier and heavier, as he and his two companions ascended higher and higher. Such a staircase, with its accessories, in the older and more crowded parts of Paris, would be bad enough now but at that time it was vile indeed to unaccustomed and unhardened senses. Every little habitation within the great foul nest of one high building, that is to say the room or rooms within every door that opened on the general staircase, left its own heap of refuse on its own landing, besides flinging other refuse from its own windows. The uncontrollable and hopeless mass of decomposition so engendered would have polluted the air, even if poverty and deprivation had not loaded it with their intangible impurities, the two bad sources combined to make it almost insupportable. Through such an atmosphere, by a steep dark shaft of dirt and poison, the way lay. Yielding to his own disturbance of mind, and to his young companion's agitation, which became greater every instant, Mr. Jarvis Lorry twice stopped the rest, each of these stoppages was made at a doleful grating, by which any languishing good airs that were left uncorrupted seemed to escape, and all spoilt and sickly vapours seemed to crawl in. Through the rusted bars, tastes rather than glimpses were caught of the jumbled neighbourhood, and nothing within range, nearer or lower than the summits of the two great towers of Notre Dame, had any promise on it of healthy life or wholesome aspirations. At last the top of the staircase was gained, and they stopped for the third time. There was yet an upper staircase of a steeper inclination and of contracted dimensions to be ascended before the garret story was reached. The keeper of the wine-shop, 
always going a little in advance, and always going on the side which Mr. Lorry took, as though he dreaded to be asked any question by the young lady, turned himself about here, and carefully feeling in the pockets of the coat he carried over his shoulder, took out a key. "'The door is locked, then, my friend?' said Mr. Lorry, surprised. "'Eh, hey, yes,' was the grim reply of Monsieur Defarge. "'You think it necessary to keep the unfortunate gentleman so retired?' "'I think it necessary to turn the key.' Monsieur Defarge whispered it closer in his ear, and frowned heavily. "'Why? Why? Because he has lived so long locked up that he would be frightened, rave, tear himself to pieces, die, come to I know not what harm if his door was left open?' "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Mr. Lorry. "'Is it possible?' repeated Defarge bitterly. "'Yes, and a beautiful world we live in when it is possible, and when many other such things are possible, and not only possible but done. Done, see you, under that sky there every day. Long live the devil. Let us go on.' This dialogue had been held in so very low a whisper that not a word of it had reached the young lady's ears. But by this time she trembled under such strong emotion, and her face expressed such deep anxiety, and above all such dread and terror, that Mr. Lorry felt it incumbent on him to speak a word or two of reassurance. "'Courage, dear miss, courage! Business! The worst will be over in a moment. It is but passing the room-door, and the worst is over. Then all the good you bring to him, all the relief, all the happiness you bring to him, begin.' Let our good friend here assist you on that side. That's well, friend Defarge. Come now, business, business. They went up, slowly and softly. The staircase was short, and they were soon at the top. There, as it had an abrupt turn in it, they came all at once in sight of three men, whose heads were bent down close together at the side of a door, and who were intently peering into the room to which the door belonged, through some chinks or holes in the wall. On hearing footsteps close at hand, these three turned and rose, and showed themselves to be the three of one name who had been drinking in the wine-shop. "'I forgot them in the surprise of your visit,' explained Monsieur Defarge. "'Leave us, good boys. We have business here.' The three glided by, and went silently down. There appearing to be no other door on that floor, and the keeper of the wine-shop going straight to this one when they were left alone— Mr. Lorry asked him in a whisper, with a little anger, "'Do you make a show of Monsieur Manette?' "'I show him in the way you have seen to a chosen few.' "'Is that well?' "'I think it is well.' "'Who are the few? How do you choose them?' "'I choose them as real men, of my name. Jacques is my name, to whom the sight is likely to do good. Enough. You're English. That is another thing.' "'Stay there, if you please, a little moment.' With an admonitory gesture to keep them back, he stooped and looked in through the crevice in the wall. Soon raising his head again, he struck twice or thrice upon the door, evidently with no other object than to make a noise there. With the same intention, he drew the key across it three or four times, before he put it clumsily into the lock, and turned it as heavily as he could. The door slowly opened inward under his hand, and he looked into the room and said something. A faint voice answered something. Little more than a single syllable could have been spoken on either side. He looked back over his shoulder and beckoned them to enter. Mr. Lorry got his arm securely round the daughter's waist and held her, for he felt that she was sinking. "'Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, business!' "'Business,' he urged, with a moisture that was not of business, shining upon his cheek. "'Come in, come in.' "'I am afraid of it,' she answered, shuddering. "'Of it? What? I mean of him, of my father.' Rendered in a manner desperate by her state, and by the beckoning of their conductor, he drew over his neck the arm that shook upon his shoulder, lifted her a little, and hurried her into the room. He set her down just within the door, and held her, clinging to him. Defarge drew out the key, closed the door, locked it on the inside, took out the key again, and held it in his hand. All this he did methodically, 
and with as loud and harsh an accompaniment of noise as he could make. Finally he walked across the room with a measured tread to where the window was. He stopped there and faced round. The garret, built to be a depository for firewood and the like, was dim and dark, for the window of dormer shape was in truth a door in the roof, with a little crane over it, for the hoisting up of stores from the street, unglazed and closing up the middle in two pieces like any other door of French construction. To exclude the cold, one half of this door was fast closed, and the other was opened but a very little way. Such a scanty portion of light was admitted through these means, that it was difficult on first coming in to see anything, and long habit alone could have slowly formed in any one the ability to do any work requiring nicety in such obscurity. Yet work of that kind was being done in the garret, for with his back to the door, and his face towards the window, where the keeper of the wine-shop stood looking at him, a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward, and very busy making shoes. End of Book One, Chapter Five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book One, Chapter Six The Shoemaker "'Good day,' said Monsieur Defarge, looking down at the white head that bent low over the shoemaking. It was raised for a moment, and a very faint voice responded to the salutation, as if it were at a distance. "'Good day.' "'You are still hard at work, I see.' After a long silence, the head was lifted for another moment, and the voice replied, "'Yes, I am working.' This time a pair of haggard eyes had looked at the questioner before the face had dropped again. The faintness of the voice was pitiable and dreadful. It was not the faintness of physical weakness, though confinement and hard fare no doubt had their part in it. Its deplorable peculiarity was that it was the faintness of solitude and disuse. It was like the last feeble echo of a sound made long and long ago. So entirely had it lost the life and resonance of the human voice that it affected the senses like a once beautiful color faded away into a poor, weak stain. So sunken and suppressed it was, that it was like a voice underground. So expressive it was, of a hopeless and lost creature, that a famished traveler, wearied out by lonely wandering in a wilderness, would have remembered home and friends in such a tone before lying down to die. Some minutes of silent work had passed, and the haggard eyes had looked up again, not with any interest or curiosity, but with a dull mechanical perception beforehand that the spot where the only visitor they were aware of had stood was not yet empty. "'I want,' said Defarge, who had not removed his gaze from the shoemaker, "'to let a little more light here. You can bear a little more.' The shoemaker stopped his work, looked with a vacant air of listening at the floor on one side of him, then similarly at the floor on the other side of him, then upward at the speaker. "'What did you say?' You can bear a little more light. I must bear it if you let it in, laying the palest shadow of a stress upon the second word. The open half-door was opened a little further, and secured at that angle for the time. A broad ray of light fell into the garret, and showed the workman with an unfinished shoe upon his lap, pausing in his labor. A few common tools and various scraps of leather were at his feet and on his bench. He had a white beard, raggedly cut, but not very long, a hollow face, and exceedingly bright eyes. The hollowness and thinness of his face would have caused them to look large under his yet dark eyebrows and his confused white hair, though they had really been otherwise. But they were naturally large, and looked unnaturally so. His yellow rags of shirt lay open at the throat, and showed his body to be withered and worn. He and his old canvas frock, and his loose stockings, and all his poor tatters of clothes, had, in a long seclusion from direct light and air, faded to such a dull uniformity of parchment yellow, that it would have been hard to say which was which. He had put up a hand between his eyes and the light, and the very bones of it seemed transparent. So he sat with a steadfastly vacant gaze, pausing in his work. He never looked at the figure before him, without first looking down on this side of himself, then on that, as if he had lost the habit of associating place with sound. 
He never spoke without first wandering in this manner and forgetting to speak. "'Are you going to finish that pair of shoes today?' asked Defarge, motioning to Mr. Lorry to come forward. "'What did you say?' Do you mean to finish that pair of shoes today? I can't say that I mean to. I suppose so. I don't know. But the question reminded him of his work, and he bent over it again. Mr. Lorry came silently forward, leaving the daughter by the door. When he had stood for a minute or two by the side of Defarge, the shoemaker looked up. He showed no surprise at seeing another figure, but the unsteady fingers of one of his hands strayed to his lips as he looked at it. His lips and his nails were of the same pale lead color. And then the hand dropped to his work, and he once more bent over the shoe. The look and the action had occupied but an instant. "'You have a visitor, you see,' said Mr. Defarge. "'What did you say?' "'Here is a visitor.' The shoemaker looked up as before, but without removing a hand from his work. Come, said Defarge, here is monsieur who knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. Show him that shoe you are working at. Take it, monsieur. Mr. Lorry took it in his hand. Tell monsieur what kind of shoe it is and the maker's name. There was a longer pause than usual before the shoemaker replied, I forget what it was you asked me. What did you say? I said... "'Couldn't you describe the kind of shoe for monsieur's information?' "'It is a lady's shoe. "'It is a young lady's walking shoe. "'It is in the present mode. I, "'I never saw the mode. "'I have had a pattern in my hand.' "'He glanced at the shoe with some little passing touch of pride. "'And the maker's name?' said Defarge. "'Now that he had no work to hold, "'he laid the knuckles of the right hand in the hollow of the left.' and then the knuckles of the left hand in the hollow of the right, and passed a hand across his bearded chin, and so on, in regular changes, without a moment's intermission. The task of recalling him from the vagrancy into which he always sank when he had spoken was like recalling some very weak person from a swoon, or endeavouring, in the hope of some disclosure, to stay the spirit of a fast-dying man. "'Did you ask me for my name?' "'Assuredly I did.' One hundred and five North Tower. Is that all? One hundred and five North Tower. With a weary sound that was not a sigh nor a groan, he bent to work again until the silence was again broken. You're not a shoemaker by trade, said Mr. Lorry, looking steadfastly at him. His haggard eyes turned to Defarge as if he would have transferred the question to him, but as no help came from that quarter, they turned back on the questioner when they had sought the ground. "'I am not a shoemaker by trade?' "'No, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I—I I learnt it here. I, I taught myself. I asked leave to—' He lapsed away, even for minutes, wringing those measured changes on his hands the whole time. His eyes came slowly back, at last, to the face from which they had wandered. When they had rested on it, he started— and resumed, in the manner of a sleeper that moment awake, reverting to a subject of last night. I asked leave to teach myself, and I got it with much difficulty after a long while, and I have made shoes ever since. As he held out his hand for the shoe that had been taken from him, Mr. Lorry said, still looking steadfastly in his face, Monsieur Manette, do you remember nothing of me?' The shoe dropped to the ground, and he sat looking fixedly at the questioner. "'Monsieur Manette,' Mr. Lorry laid his hand upon Defarge's arm, "'do you remember nothing of this man? Look at him. Look at me. Is there no old banker, no old business, no old servant, no old time rising in your mind, Monsieur Manette?' As the captive of many years sat looking fixedly by turns at Mr. Lorry and at Defarge, some long obliterated marks of an actively intent intelligence in the middle of the forehead gradually forced themselves through the black mist that had fallen on him. They were overclouded again. They were fainter. They were gone. But they had been there. And so exactly was the expression repeated on the fair young face of her who had crept along the wall to a point where she could see him, and where she now stood looking at him, with hands which at first had been only raised in frightened compassion, 
if not even to keep him off and shut out the sight of him, but which were now extending towards him, trembling with eagerness to lay the spectral face upon her warm young breast and love it back to life and hope. So exactly was the expression repeated, though in stronger characters, on her fair young face, that it looked as though it passed like a moving light from him to her. Darkness had fallen on him in its place. He looked at the two less and less attentively, and in his eyes in gloomy abstraction sought the ground and looked about him in the old way. Finally, with a deep, long sigh, he took the shoe up and resumed his work. "'Have you recognized it, monsieur?' asked Defarge in a whisper. "'Yes, for a moment. At first I thought it quite hopeless. But I have unquestionably seen, for a single moment, the face that I once knew so well. Hush, let us draw farther back. Hush!' She had moved from the wall of the garret, very near to the bench on which he sat. There was something awful in his unconsciousness of the figure that could have put out its hand and touched him as he stooped over his labor. Not a word was spoken, not a sound was made. She stood like a spirit beside him, and he bent over his work. It happened at length that he had occasion to change the instrument in his hand for his shoemaker's knife. It lay on that side of him which was not on the side on which she stood. He had taken it up and was stooping to work again when his eyes caught the skirt of her dress. He raised them and saw her face. The two spectators started forward, but she stayed them with the motion of her hand. She had no fear of his striking at her with the knife, though they had. He stared at her with a fearful look, and after a while his lips began to form some words, though no sound proceeded from them. By degrees, in the pauses of his quick and labored breathing, he was heard to say, What is this? With the tears streaming down her face, she put her two hands to her lips and kissed them to him then clasped them on her breast as if she laid his ruined head there. "'You are not the jailer's daughter?' She sighed, "'No. "'Who are you?' Not yet trusting the tones of her voice, she sat down on the bench beside him. He recoiled, but she laid her hand upon his arm. A strange thrill struck him when she did so, and visibly passed over his frame. He laid the knife down softly as he sat staring at her. Her golden hair, which she wore in long curls, had been hurriedly pushed aside and fell down over her neck. Advancing his hand by little and little, he took it up and looked at it. In the midst of the action he went astray and, with another deep sigh, fell to work at his shoemaking. But not for long. Releasing his arm, she laid her hand upon his shoulder. After looking doubtfully at it two or three times, as if to be sure that it was really there, he laid down his work, put his hand to his neck, and took off a blackened string with a scrap of folded rag attached to it. He opened this carefully on his knee, and it contained a very little quantity of hair, not more than one or two long golden hairs, which he had in some old day wound off upon his finger. He took her hair into his hand again and looked closely at it. It is the same. How can it be? When was it? How was it? As the concentrated expression returned to his forehead, he seemed to become conscious that it was in hers, too. He turned her full to the light and looked at her. She had laid her head upon my shoulder that night when I was summoned out. She had a fear of my going, though I had none. And when I was brought to the North Tower, they found these upon my sleeve. You will leave me, them. They can never help me to escape in the body, though they may in the spirit. Those were the words I said. I remember them very well. He formed this speech with his lips many times before he could utter it. But when he did find spoken words for it, they came to him coherently, though slowly. How was this? Was it you? Once more, the two spectators started as he turned upon her with a frightful suddenness. But she sat perfectly still in his grasp and only said in a low voice, I entreat you, good gentlemen, do not come near us, do not speak, do not move. Hark! he exclaimed. Whose voice was that? His hands released her as he uttered this cry, and went up to his white hair, which they tore in a frenzy. It died out, as everything but his shoemaking did die out of him, 
and he refolded his little packet and tried to secure it in his breast. But he still looked at her and gloomily shook his head. No, no, no. You are too young, too blooming. It can't be. See what the prisoner is. These are not the hands she knew. This is not the face she knew. This is not a voice she ever heard. No, no. She was, and he was, before the slow years of the North Tower, ages ago. What is your name, my gentle angel? Hailing his softened tone and manner, his daughter fell upon her knees before him, with her appealing hands upon his breast. Oh, sir, at another time you shall know my name, and who my mother was, and who my father, and how I never knew their hard, hard history. But I cannot tell you at this time, and I cannot tell you here. All that I may tell you here and now is that I pray to you to touch me and bless me. Kiss me, kiss me, oh my dear, my dear. His cold white head mingled with her radiant hair, which warmed and lighted it, as though it were the light of freedom shining on him. If you hear in my voice, and I don't know that it is so, but I hope it is, if you hear in my voice any resemblance to a voice that was once sweet music in your ears, weep for it, weep for it. If you touch, in touching my hair, anything that recalls a beloved head that lay on your breast when you were young and free, weep for it, weep for it. If, when I hint to you of a home that is before us, where I will be true to you with all my duty and, and with all my faithful service, I bring back the remembrance of a home long desolate, while your poor heart pined away, weep for it, weep for it. She held him closer round the neck and rocked him on her breast like a child. If, when I tell you, dearest dear, that your agony is over, and that I have come here to take you from it, and that we go to England to be at peace and at rest, I cause you to think of your useful life laid waste, and of our native France so wicked to you. Weep for it, weep for it. And if, when I shall tell you of my name, and of my father who is living, and of my mother who is dead, you learn that I have to kneel to my honored father, and implore his pardon for having never for his sake striven all day, and lain awake and wept all night, because the love of my poor mother hid his torture from me. Weep for it, weep for it. Weep for her, then, and for me. Good gentlemen, thank God. I feel his sacred tears upon my face, and his sobs strike against my heart. Oh, see, thank God for us. Thank God. He had sunk in her arms, and his face dropped upon her breast. A sight so touching, yet so terrible, and the tremendous wrong and suffering which had gone before it, that the two beholders covered their faces. When the quiet of the garret had long been undisturbed, and his heaving breast and shaken form had long yielded to the calm that must follow all storms, emblem to humanity, of the rest and the silence into which the storm called life must hush at last, they came forward to raise the father and daughter from the ground. He had gradually dropped to the floor and lay there in a lethargy, worn out. She had nestled down with him, that his head might lie upon her arm, and her hair drooping over him curtained him from the light. If, without disturbing him, she said, raising her hand to Mr. Lorry as he stooped over them, after repeated blowings of his nose, all could be arranged for our leaving Paris at once, so that from the very door he could be taken away. But consider, is he fit for the journey? asked Mr. Lorry. More fit for that, I think, than to remain in this city so dreadful to him. It is true, said Defarge, who was kneeling to look on and hear. More than that, Monsieur Manette is, for all reasons, best out of France. Say, shall I hire a carriage and post-horses? That's business, said Mr. Lorry, resuming on the shortest notice his methodical manners. And if business is to be done, I had better do it. Then be so kind, urged Miss Manette, as to leave us here. You see how composed he has become, and you cannot be afraid to leave him with me now. Why should you be? If you will lock the door to secure us from interruption, I do not doubt that you will find him, when you come back, as quiet as you leave him. In any case, I will take care of him until you return. Then we will remove him straight. Both Mr. Lorry and Defarge were rather disinclined to this course, and in favor of one of them remaining. But as there were not only carriage and horses to be seen to, but traveling papers, and as time pressed, for the day was drawing to an end, it came at last to their hastily dividing the business that was necessary to be done, and hurrying away to do it. Then, as the darkness closed in, 
The daughter laid her head down upon the hard ground close at the father's side and watched him. The darkness deepened and deepened, and they both lay quiet until a light gleamed through the chinks in the wall. Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey, and had brought with them, besides travelling cloaks and papers, bread and meat, wine and hot coffee. Monsieur Defarge put this provender and the lamp he carried on the shoemaker's bench. There was nothing else in the garret but a pallet bed, and he and Mr. Lorry roused the captive and assisted him to his feet. No human intelligence could have read the mysteries in his mind, in the scared, blank wonder of his face. Whether he knew what had happened, whether he recollected what they had said to him, whether he knew that he was free, were questions no sagacity could have solved. They tried speaking to him, but he was so confused and so very slow to answer that they took fright at his bewilderment and agreed for the time to tamper with him no more. He had a wild, lost manner of occasionally clasping his head in his hands that had not been seen in him before, yet he had some pleasure in the mere sound of his daughter's voice and invariably turned to it when she spoke. In the submissive way of one long accustomed to obey under coercion, he ate and drank what they gave him to eat and drink, and put on the cloak and other wrappings that they gave him to wear. He readily responded to his daughter's drawing her arm through his, and took and kept her hand in both his own. They began to descend, Monsieur Defarge going first with the lamp, Mr. Lorry closing the little procession. They had not traversed many steps of the long main staircase when he stopped and stared at the roof and round at the walls. "'You remember the place, my father? You remember coming up here?' "'What did you say?' But before she could repeat the question, he murmured an answer as if she had repeated it. "'Remember? No, I don't remember. It was so very long ago.' That he had no recollection whatever of his having been brought from his prison to that house was apparent to them. They heard him mutter, "'One hundred and five North Tower.' and when he looked about him, it was evidently for the strong fortress walls which had encompassed him. On their reaching the courtyard, he instinctively altered his tread, as being in expectation of a drawbridge, and when there was no drawbridge, and he saw the carriage waiting in the open street, he dropped his daughter's hand and clasped his head again. No crowd was about the door, no people were discernible at any of the many windows, not even a chance passer-by was in the street, and a natural silence and desertion reigned there. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. The prisoner had got into a coach, and his daughter had followed him, when Mr. Lorry's feet were arrested on the step by his asking, miserably, for his shoemaking tools and the unfinished shoes. Madame Defarge immediately called to her husband that she would get them, and went, knitting, out of the lamplight through the courtyard. She quickly brought them down and handed them in, and immediately afterwards leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. Defarge got upon the box and gave the word, To the barrier! The postillion cracked his whip and they clattered away under the feeble overswinging lamps. Under the overswinging lamps, swinging ever brighter in the better streets, and ever dimmer in the worse, and by lighted shops, gay crowds, illuminated coffee houses and theater doors to one of the city gates. Soldiers with lanterns at the guardhouse there, "'Your papers, travellers!' "'See here, then, monsieur the officer,' said Defarge, getting down and taking him gravely apart. "'These are the papers of monsieur inside, with the white head. "'They were consigned to me, with him, at the—' "'He dropped his voice. "'There was a flutter among the military lanterns, "'and one of them being handed into the coach by an arm in uniform. "'The eyes connected with the arm looked, not an every day or every night look, "'at monsieur with the white head. "'It is well. Forward!' from the uniform. Adieu, from Defarge. And so, under a short grove of feebler and feebler overswinging lamps, out under the great grove of stars. Beneath that arch of unmoved and eternal lights, some so remote from this little earth that the learned tell us it is doubtful whether their rays have even yet discovered it, as a point in space where anything is suffered or done, the shadows of the night were broad and black. All through the cold and restless interval, until dawn, they once more whispered in the ears of Mr. Jarvis Lorry, sitting opposite the buried man who had been dug out, and wondering what subtle powers were forever lost to him, and what were capable of restoration, the old inquiry, I hope you care to be recalled to life, and the old answer, I can't say.
End of Book 1, Chapter 6 Recorded on February 17th, 2006 by Jamie Osborne in El Paso, Texas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zale Schaefer A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second The Golden Thread Chapter One Five Years Later Telson's Bank by Temple Bar was an old-fashioned place even in the year 1780. It was very small, very dark, very ugly, very incommodious. It was an old-fashioned place, moreover, in the moral attribute that the partners in the house were proud of its smallness, proud of its darkness, proud of its ugliness, proud of its incommodiousness. They were even boastful of its eminence in those particulars, and were fired by an express conviction that if it were less objectionable, it would be less respectable. This was no passive belief, but an active weapon which they flashed at more convenient places of business. Telson's, they said, wanted no elbow room. Telson's wanted no light. Telson's wanted no embellishment. Noakes and companies might, or Snooks brothers might, but Telson's, thank heaven. Any one of these partners would have disinherited his son on the question of rebuilding Telson's. In this respect, the house was much on a par with the country, which did very often disinherit its sons for suggesting improvements in laws and customs that had long been highly objectionable, but were only the more respectable. Thus it had come to pass that Telson's was the triumphant perfection of inconvenience. After bursting open a door of idiotic obstinacy with a weak rattle in its throat, you fell into Telson's down two steps and came to your senses in a miserable little shop with two little counters where the oldest of men made your check shake as if the wind rustled it, while they examined the signature by the dingiest of windows, which were always under a shower bath of mud from Fleet Street, and which were made the dingier by their own iron bars proper and the heavy shadow of Temple Bar. If your business necessitated your seeing the house, you were put into a species of condemned hold at the back, where you meditated on a misspent life until the house came with its hands in its pockets and you could hardly blink at it in the dismal twilight. Your money came out of or went into wormy old wooden drawers, particles of which flew up your nose and down your throat when they were opened and shut. Your banknotes had a musty odor as if they were fast decomposing into rags again. Your plate was stowed away among the neighboring cesspools, and evil communications corrupted its good polish in a day or two. Your deeds got into extemporized strong rooms made of kitchens and sculleries, and fretted all the fat out of their parchments into the banking house air. Your lighter boxes of family papers went upstairs into a barmecide room that always had a great dining table in it and never had a dinner, and where, even in the year 1780, the first letters written to you by your old love, or by your little children, were but newly released from the horror of being ogled through the windows by the heads exposed on Temple Bar with an insensate brutality and ferocity worthy of Abyssinia or Ashanti. But indeed, at that time, putting to death was a recipe much in vogue with all trades and professions, and not least of all with Telson's. Death is nature's remedy for all things, and why not legislation's? Accordingly, the forger was put to death, the utterer of a bad note was put to death, the unlawful opener of a letter was put to death, the purloiner of forty shillings and sixpence was put to death, the holder of a horse at Telson's door who made off with it was put to death, the coiner of a bad shilling was put to death, the sounders of three-fourths of the notes in the whole gamut of crime were put to death. Not that it did the least good in the way of prevention. It might almost have been worth remarking that the fact was exactly the reverse, but it cleared off, as to this world, the trouble of each particular case, and left nothing else connected with it to be looked after. Thus Telson's, in its day, like greater places of business, its contemporaries, had taken so many lives that if the heads laid low before it had been ranged on Temple Bar instead of being privately disposed of, 
they would have probably excluded what little light the ground floor had in a rather significant manner. Cramped in all kinds of dim cupboards and hutches at Telson's, the oldest of men carried on the business gravely. When they took a young man into Telson's London house, they hid him somewhere until he was old. They kept him in a dark place like a cheese until he had the full Telson flavor and blue mold upon him. Then only was he permitted to be seen, spectacularly poring over large books and casting his breeches and gaiters into the general weight of the establishment. Outside Telson's, never by any means in it, unless called in, was an odd job man, an occasional porter and messenger, who served as the life sign of the house. He was never absent during business hours unless upon an errand, and then he was represented by his son, a grisly urchin of twelve who was his express image. People understood that Telson's, in a stately way, tolerated the odd job man. The house had always tolerated some person in that capacity, and time and tide had drifted this person to the post. His surname was Cruncher, and on the youthful occasion of his renouncing by proxy the works of darkness in the easterly parish church of Houndsditch, he had received the added appellation of Jerry. The scene was Mr. Cruncher's private lodging in Hanging Sword Alley, Whitefriars. The time, half-past seven of the clock on a windy March morning, Anno Domini, 1780. Mr. Cruncher himself always spoke of the year of our Lord as Anna Dominoes, apparently under the impression that the Christian era dated from the invention of a popular game by a lady who had bestowed her name upon it. Mr. Cruncher's apartments were not in a savory neighborhood, and were but two in number, even if a closet with a single pane of glass in it might be counted as one, but they were very decently kept. Early as it was on the windy March morning, the room in which he lay abed was already scrubbed throughout, and between the cups and saucers arranged for breakfast, and the lumbering deal table, a very clean white cloth was spread. Mr. Cruncher reposed under a patchwork counterpane like a harlequin at home. At first he slept heavily, but by degrees began to roll and surge in bed until he rose above the surface with his spiky hair looking as if it must tear the sheets to ribbons, at which juncture he exclaimed in a voice of dire exasperation, "'Bust me if she ain't at it again!' A woman of orderly and industrious appearance rose from her knees in a corner with sufficient haste and trepidation to show that she was the person referred to. "'What?' said Mr. Cruncher, looking out of bed for a boot. "'You're at it again, are you?' After hailing the morn with this second salutation, he threw a boot at the woman as a third. It was a very muddy boot, and may introduce the odd circumstance connected with Mr. Cruncher's domestic economy, that whereas he often came home after banking hours with clean boots, he often got up next morning to find the same boots covered with clay. "'What?' said Mr. Cruncher, varying his apostrophe, after missing his mark. "'What are you up to, agger waiter "'I was only saying my prayers.' "'Saying your prayers? You're a nice woman. What do you mean by flopping yourself down and praying again me?' "'I was not praying against you. I was praying for you.' "'You weren't. And if you were, I won't be took the liberty with. Here, your mother's a nice woman, young Jerry, going to praying again your father's prosperity. You've got a dutiful mother you have, my son. You've got a religious mother you have, my boy, going and flopping herself down and praying that the bread and butter may be snatched out of the mouth of her only child. Master Cruncher, who was in his shirt, took this very ill, and turning to his mother, strongly deprecated any praying away of his personal board. "'And what do you suppose, you conceited female,' said Mr. Cruncher, with unconscious inconsistency, "'that the worth of your prayers may be? Name the price that you put your prayers at.' They only come from the heart, Jerry. They are worth no more than that. Worth no more than that, repeated Mr. Cruncher. They ain't worth much, then. Whether or no, I won't be prayed again, I tell you. I can't afford it. I'm not a-going to be made unlucky by your sneaking. If you must go flopping yourself down, flop in favor of your husband and child, not in opposition to him. If I had had any but an unnatural wife, and this poor boy had had any but an unnatural mother, I might have made some money last week, instead of being counterprayed and countermined and religiously circumvented into the worst of luck. Bust me, said Mr. Cruncher, who all this time had been putting on his clothes. If I ain't, what with piety and one blowed thing and another, been choosed this last week into as bad luck as ever a poor devil of a honest tradesman met with. 
Young Jerry, dress yourself, my boy, and while I clean my boots, keep an eye on your mother and now and then, and if you see any signs of more flopping, give me a call. For I tell you, here he addressed his wife once more, I won't be gone again in this manner. I am as rickety as a hackney coach. I'm as sleepy as laudanum. My lines is strained to that degree that I shouldn't know if it wasn't for the pain in em, which was me and which somebody else, yet I'm none the better for it in pocket, and it's my suspicion that you've been at it from morning to night to prevent me from being the better for it in pocket, and I won't put up with it, agora waiter, and what do you say now? Growling, in addition, such phrases as Ah, yes, you're religious, too. You wouldn't put yourself in opposition to the interests of your husband and child, would you? Not you, and throwing off other sarcastic sparks from the whirling grindstone of his indignation, Mr. Cruncher betook himself to his boot-cleaning and his general preparation for business. In the meantime, his son, whose head was garnished with tender spikes, and whose young eyes stood close by one another, as his father's did, kept the required watch upon his mother. He greatly disturbed that poor woman at intervals by darting out of his sleeping closet where he made his toilet with a suppressed cry of, You are going to flop, mother. Hello, father. And after raising this fictitious alarm, darting in again with an undutiful grin. Mr. Cruncher's temper was not at all improved when he came to his breakfast. He resented Mrs. Cruncher saying grace with particular animosity. Now, Agora waiter, what are you up to? At it again? His wife explained that she had merely asked a blessing. "'Don't do it,' said Mr. Cruncher, looking about as if he rather expected to see the loaf disappear under the efficacy of his wife's petitions. "'I ain't a-going to be blessed out of house and home. I won't have my whittles blessed off my table. Keep still!' Exceedingly red-eyed and grim, as if he had been up all night at a party which had taken anything but a convivial turn, Jerry Cruncher worried his breakfast rather than ate it, growling over it like any four-footed inmate of a menagerie. Towards nine o'clock he smoothed his ruffled aspect, and presenting as respectable and businesslike an exterior as he could overlay his natural self with, issued forth to the occupation of the day. It could scarcely be called a trade, in spite of his favorite description of himself as an honest tradesman. His stock consisted of a wooden stool made out of a broken back chair cut down, which stool young Jerry, walking at his father's side, carried every morning to beneath the banking-house window that was nearest Temple Bar, where, with the addition of the first handful of straw that could be gleaned from any passing vehicle to keep the cold and wet from the odd-job man's feet, it formed the encampment for the day. On this post of his, Mr. Cruncher was as well known to Fleet Street and the Temple as the bar itself, and was almost as ill-looking. Encamped at a quarter before nine, in good time to touch his three-cornered hat to the oldest of men as they passed into Telson's, Jerry took up his station on this windy March morning, with young Jerry standing by him, when not engaged in making forays through the bar to inflict bodily and mental injuries of an acute description on passing boys who were small enough for his amiable purpose. Father and son, extremely like each other, looking silently on at the morning traffic in Fleet Street, with their two heads as near to one another as the two eyes of each were, bore a considerable resemblance to a pair of monkeys. The resemblance was not lessened by the accidental circumstance that the mature Jerry bit and spat out straw, while the twinkling eyes of the youthful Jerry were as restlessly watchful of him as of everything else in Fleet Street. The head of one of the regular indoor messengers attached to Telson's establishment was put through the door, and the word was given. Porter wanted. Hooray, father, here's an early job to begin with. Having thus given his parent Godspeed, young Jerry seated himself on the stool, entered on his reversionary interest in the straw his father had been chewing, and cogitated. Always rusty. His fingers is always rusty, muttered young Jerry. Where does my father get all that iron rust from? He don't get no iron rust here. End of chapter one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 12, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Chapter 2 A Sight. 
"'You know the old Bailey well, no doubt,' said one of the oldest clerks to Jerry the messenger. "'Yes, sir,' returned Jerry, in something of a dogged manner. "'I do know the Bailey.' "'Just so. And you know Mr. Lorry?' "'I know Mr. Lorry, sir. Much better than I know the Bailey. Much better,' said Jerry, not done like a reluctant witness at the establishment in question, than I, as an honest tradesman, wish to know the Bailey. "'Very well. Find the door where the witnesses go in, and show the doorkeeper this note for Mr. Lorry. He will then let you in.' "'Into the court, sir?' into the court. Mr. Cruncher's eyes seemed to get a little closer to one another, and to interchange the inquiry, "'What do you think of this?' "'Am I to wait in the court, sir?' he asked, as a result of that conference. "'I am going to tell you. The doorkeeper will pass the note to Mr. Lorry, and do you make any gesture that will attract Mr. Lorry's attention and show him where you stand. Then what you have to do is to remain there until he wants you. Is that all, sir? That is all. He wishes to have a messenger on hand. This is to tell him you are there. As the ancient clerk deliberately folded and superscribed the note, Mr. Cruncher, after surveying him in silence until he came to the blotting-paper stage, remarked, "'I suppose they'll be trying forgeries this morning?' "'Treason.' "'That's quartering,' said Jerry. "'Barbarous!' "'It is the law,' remarked the ancient clerk, turning his surprised spectacles upon him. "'It is the law.' "'It's hard in the law to spoil a man like that, I think. It's hard enough to kill him. I know it very hard to spoil him, sir.' "'Not at all.' retained the ancient clerk. Speak well of the law. Take care of your chest and voice, my good friend, and leave the law to take care of itself. I give you that advice. It's the damp, sir, what settles on my chest and voice, says Jerry. I'll leave you to judge what a damp way of earning a living mine is, sir. Well, well, said the old clerk. We all have our various ways of gaining a livelihood. Some have damp ways, and some have dry ways. Here is the letter. Go along. Jerry took the letter, and, remarking to himself with less internal deference than he made an outward show of, You are lean old one, too, made the bow, informed his son in passing of his destination, and went his way. They hanged at Tyburn in those days, so the street outside Newgate had not obtained one infamous notoriety that has since attached to it, but the jail was a vile place in which most kinds of debauchery and villainy were practiced, and where dire diseases were bred that came into court with the prisoners, and sometimes rushed straight from the dock at Lord Chief Justice himself and pulled him off the bench. It had more than once happened that the judge in the black cap pronounced his own doom as certainly as the prisoners, and even died before him. For the rest, the old Bailey was famous as a kind of deadly inn-yard, from which pale travellers set out continually, in carts and coaches, on a violent passage into the other world traversing some two miles and a half of public street and road, and shaming few good citizens, if any. So powerful is use, and so desirable to be good use in the beginning. It was famous, too, for the pillory, a wise old institution, that inflicted the punishment of which no one could foresee the extent. Also for the whipping-post, another dear old institution, very humanizing and softening to behold in action. Also, for extensive transactions in blood money, another fragment of ancestral wisdom, systematically leading to the most frightful mercenary crimes that could be committed under heaven. Another, the old Bailey, at that date, was a choice illustration of the precept, Whatever is, 
is right, an aphorism that would be as final as it was lazy, did not include the troublesome consequence that nothing that ever was, was wrong. Making his way through the tainted crowd, dispersed up and down this hideous sense of action with the skill of a man accustomed to making his way quietly, the messenger found out the door that he sought and handed in his letter through a trap in it. For people then paid to see the play at the Old Bailey, just as they paid to see the play in Bedlam. Only the former entertainment was much the dearer. Therefore all the Old Bailey doors were well guarded, except, indeed, the social doors by which the criminals got there, and those were always left wide open. After some delay and demur, the door grudgingly turned on its hinges a very little way, and allowed Mr. Jerry Cruncher to squeeze himself into court. "'What's on?' he asked in a whisper, of the man he found himself next to. "'Nothing yet.' "'What's coming on?' "'The treason case.' "'The quartering one, eh?' Ma returned the man with relish. He'll be drawn on a hurdle to be half hanged, then he'll be taken down and sliced before his own face, then his inside will be taken out and burnt while he looks on, then his head will be chopped off and he'll be cut into quarters. That's the sentence. If he's found guilty, you mean to say, Jerry added by way of proviso. Oh, they'll find him guilty, said the other. Don't you be afraid of that. Mr. Cruncher's attention was here diverted to the doorkeeper, whom he saw making his way to Mr. Lorry with the note in his hand. Mr. Lorry sat at a table among the gentlemen in wigs, not far from a wig gentleman, the prisoner's counsel, who had a great bundle of papers before him was nearly opposite another wigged gentleman, with his hands in his pockets, whose whole attention, when Mr. Cruncher looked at him, then nor afterwards, seemed to be concentrated on the ceiling of the court. After some gruff coughing and rubbing of his chin and signing with his hand, Jerry attracted the notice of Mr. Lorry, who had stood up to look for him, and who quietly nodded and sat down again. "'What's he got to do with the case?' asked the man he had spoken with. "'Blessed if I know,' said Jerry. "'And what have you got to do with it, then, if a person may inquire?' "'Blessed if I know that either,' said Jerry. The entrance of the judge and consequent great stir and settling down in the court stopped the dialogue. Presently the dock became the central point of interest. Two jailers who had been standing there went out, and the prisoner was brought in and put to the bar. Everybody present, except the one wigged gentleman who looked at the ceiling, stared at him. All the human breath in the place rolled at him like a sea or a wind or a fire. Eager faces strained round the pillars and corners to get a sight of him. Spectators in back rows stood up not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them to help themselves at anybody's cost to view of him. Stood a tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing to see every inch of him. Conspicuous among these latter, like an animated bit of the spiked wall of Newgate, Jerry stood, aiming at the prisoner the beery breath of a whet he had taken as he came along, and discharging it to mingle with the ways of the other beer, and gin, and tea, and coffee, and what not, that flowed at him, and had already broke upon the great windows behind him in an impure mist and rain. The object of all this staring and blaring was a young man of about five-and-twenty, well-grown and well-looking, with a sunburnt cheek and a dark eye. 
His condition was that of a young gentleman. He was plainly dressed in black or very dark gray, and his hair, which was long and dark, was gathered in a ribbon at the back of his neck, more to be out of his way than for ornament. As an emotion of the mind will express itself through any covering of the body, so the paleness which his situation engendered came through the brown upon his cheek, showing the soul to be stronger than the sun. He was otherwise quite self-possessed, bowed to the judge, and stood quiet. The sort of interest which this man was stared and breathed at was not the sort that elevated humanity. Had he stood in peril of a less horrible sentence, there had been a chance of any one of its savage details being spared by just so much he would have lost in his fascination. The form that was to be doomed to be so shamefully mangled was the sight, the immortal creature that was to be so butchered and torn asunder yielded the sensation. Whatever gloss the various spectators put upon the interest, according to their several arts and powers of self-deceit, the interest was, at the root of it, ogreish. Silence in the court! Charles Darnay had yesterday pleaded not guilty to an indictment denouncing him, with infinite jingle and jangle, for that he was a false traitor to our serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth prince, our lord the king, by reason of his having on divers occasions, and by divers means and ways, assisted Louis, the French king, in his wars against our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, that is to say, by coming and going between the dominions of our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, and those of the said French Louis, and wickedly, falsely, traitorously, and otherwise evil adverbiously, revealing to the said French Louis what forces our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth had in preparation to send to Canada and North America. This much, Jerry, with his head becoming more and more spiky as the law terms bristled it, made out with huge satisfaction, and so arrived circuitously at the understanding that the aforesaid, and over and over again aforesaid, Charles Darnay, stood there before him upon his trial, that the jury was swearing in, and that Mr. Attorney General was making ready to speak. The accused, who was, and who knew he was, being mentally hanged, beheaded, and quartered by everybody there, neither flinched from the situation, nor assumed any theatrical air in it. He was quiet and attentive, watched the opening proceedings with a grave interest, and stood with his hands resting on the slab of wood before him so composedly that they had not displaced a leaf of the herbs with which it was strewn. The court was all bestrewn with herbs and sprinkled with vinegar, as a precaution against jail air and jail fever. Over the prisoner's head there was a mirror to throw the light down upon him. Crowds of the wicked and the wretched had been reflected in it and had passed from its surface and this earth's altogether. Haunted in a most ghastly manner that abominable place would have been if the glass could ever have rendered back its reflections, as the ocean is one day to give up its dead. Some passing thought of the infamy and disgrace for which it had been reserved may have struck the prisoner's mind. Be that as it may, a change in his position, making him conscious of a bar of light across his face, he looked up, and when he saw the glass his face flushed, and his right hand pushed the herbs away. It happened that the action turned his face to that side of the court which was on his left. About on a level with his eyes there sat in that corner of the judge's bench two persons, upon whom his look immediately rested, so immediately 
and with so much changing of his aspect that all the eyes that were turned upon him turned to them. The spectators saw in the two figures a young lady of little more than twenty, and a gentleman who was evidently her father, a man of very remarkable appearance in respect of the absolute whiteness of his hair, and a certain indescribable intensity of face, not of an active kind, but pondering and self-communing. When this expression was upon him he looked as if he were old, but when it was stirred and broken up as it was now, in a moment, on his speaking to his daughter, he became a handsome man, not past the prime of life. His daughter had one of her hands drawn through his arm, and she sat by him, and the other pressed upon it. She had drawn close to him in her dread of the scene, and in her pity for the prisoner. Her forehead had been strikingly expressive, of an engrossing terror and compassion that saw nothing but the peril of the accused. This had been so very noticeable, so very powerfully and naturally shown, that starers who had had no pity for him were touched by her, and the whisper went about, "'Who are they?' Jerry, the messenger, who made his own observations in his own manner, and who had been sucking the rust off his fingers in his absorption, stretched his neck to hear who they were. The crowd about him had pressed and passed the inquiry on to the nearest attendant, and from him it had been more slowly pressed and passed back. At last it got to Jerry. Witnesses! For which side? Against! Against which side? The prisoners! The judge, whose eyes had gone in the general direction, recalled them, leaned back against his seat, and looked steadily at the man whose life was in his hand. As Mr. Attorney General rose to spin the rope, grind the axe, and hammer the nails into the scaffold. Thus ends Book Two, Chapter Two, A Sight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 12, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Three A Disappointment. Mr. Attorney General had to inform the jury that the prisoner before them, though young in years, was old in the treasonable practices which claimed the forfeit of his life. That this correspondence with the public enemy was not a correspondence of to-day, or of yesterday, or even of last year, or of the year before, that it was certain the prisoner had for longer than that been in the habit of passing and repassing between France and England on secret business of which he could give no honest account. That, if it was the nature of traitorous ways to thrive, which happily it never was, the real wickedness and guilt of his business might have remained uncovered. That providence, however, had put it into the heart of a person who was beyond fear and beyond reproach, to ferret out the nature of this prisoner's schemes, and, struck with horror, to disclose them to His Majesty's Chief Secretary of State and Most Honorable Privy Council, that this patriot would be produced before them, that his position and attitude were, on the whole, sublime, that he had been the prisoner's friend, but at once, in an auspicious and an evil hour detecting his infamy, had resolved to immolate the traitor he could no longer cherish in his bosom on the sacred altar of his country, that if statutes were decreed in Britain as in ancient Greece and Rome to public benefactors, 
this shining citizen would assuredly have had one. That, as they were not so decreed, he probably would not have one. That virtue, as had been observed by the poets in many passages which he well knew the jury would have, word for word, at the tips of their tongues, whereat the jury's countenances displayed a guilty consciousness that they knew nothing about the passages, was in a manner contagious, more especially the bright virtue known as patriotism, or love of country that the lofty example of this immaculate and unimpeachable witness for the crown, to refer to whom, however unworthily, was an honor, had communicated itself to the prisoner's servant, and had engendered in him a holy determination to examine his master's table drawers and pockets, and secret his papers that he, Mr. Attorney-General, was prepared to hear some disparagement attempted of this admirable servant, but that, in a general way, he preferred him to his, Mr. Attorney-General's, brothers and sisters, and honored him more than his, Mr. Attorney-General's, father and mother, that he called with confidence on the jury to come and do likewise, that the evidence of these two witnesses, coupled with the documents of their discovering that would be produced, would show the prisoner to have been furnished with lists of His Majesty's forces, and of their disposition and preparation both by sea and land, that would leave no doubt that he had habitually conveyed such information to a hostile power, that these lists could not be proved to be in the prisoner's handwriting, but that it was all the same, that, indeed, it was rather the better for the prosecution, as showing the prisoner to be artful in his precautions, that the proof would go back five years, and would show the prisoner already engaged in these pernicious missions, within a few weeks before the date of the very first action fought between the British troops and the Americans, that, for these reasons, the jury being a loyal jury as he knew they were, and being a responsible jury as they knew they were, must positively find the prisoner guilty and make an end of him, whether they liked it or not, that they never could tolerate the idea of their wives laying their heads upon their pillows that they never could endure the notion of their children laying their heads upon their pillows, in short, that there never could be for them or theirs any laying of heads upon pillows at all, unless the prisoner's head was taken off. That head, Mr. Attorney General concluded by demanding of them in the name of everything he could think of with a round turn on it, and on the faith of his solemn asseveration that he had already considered the prisoner as good as dead and gone. When the Attorney General ceased, a buzz arose in the court as if a cloud of great blue flies were swarming about the prisoner, in anticipation of what he was soon to become. When it toned down again, the unimpeachable patriot appeared in the witness-box. Mr. Solicitor General, then, following his leader's lead, examined the patriot, John Barsad, gentleman by name. The story of his pure soul was exactly what Mr. Attorney General had described it to be, perhaps, if it had a fault, a little too exactly. Having released his noble bosom of its burden, he would have modestly withdrawn himself, but that wigged gentleman with the papers before him, sitting not far from Mr. Lorry, begged to ask him a few questions, the wigged gentleman sitting opposite, still looking at the ceiling of the court. Had he ever been a spy himself? No, he scorned the base insinuation. What did he live upon? His property. Where was his property? He didn't precisely remember where it was. What was it? No business of anybody's. Had he inherited it? Yes, he had. From whom? Distant relation. 
Very distant? Rather. Ever been in prison? Certainly not. Never in a debtor's prison? Didn't see what that had to do with it. Never in a debtor's prison? Come, once again, never? Yes. How many times? Two or three times. Not five or six? Perhaps. Of what profession? Gentlemen. Ever been kicked? Might have been. Frequently? No. Ever kicked down the stairs? Decidedly not. Once received a kick on the top of a staircase, and then fell downwards of his own accord. Kicked on that occasion for cheating at dice? Something to that effect was said by the intoxicated liar who committed the assault, but it was not true. Swear that it was not true? Positively. Ever live by cheating at play? Never. Ever live by play? Not more than other gentlemen do. Ever borrow money of the prisoner? Yes. Ever pay him? No. Was not this intimacy with the prisoner in reality a very slight one, forced upon the prisoner in coaches, inns, and packets? No. Sure he saw the prisoner within the lists? Certain. Knew no more about the lists? No. Had not procured them himself, for instance? No. Expect to get anything by this evidence? No. Not in regular government pay and employment to lay traps? Oh, dear, no. Or to do anything? Oh, dear, no. Swear that? Over and over again. No motives but motives of sheer patriotism? None. Whatever. The virtuous servant, Roger Cly, swore his way through the case at a great rate. He had taken service with the prisoner in good faith and simplicity four years ago. He had asked the prisoner, aboard the Calais packet, if he wanted a handy fellow, and the prisoner had engaged him. He had not asked the prisoner to take the handy fellow as an act of charity, never thought of such a thing. He began to have suspicions of the prisoner, and to keep an eye upon him soon afterwards. In arranging his clothes while travelling, he had seen similar lists to these in the prisoner's pockets over and over again. He had taken these lists from the drawer of the prisoner's desk. He had not put them there first. He had seen the prisoner show these identical lists to French gentlemen at Calais, and similar lists to French gentlemen both at Calais and Bologna. He loved his country, and couldn't bear it, and had given information. He had never been suspected of stealing a silver teapot. He had been maligned respecting a mustard pot, but it turned out only to be a plated one. He had known the last witnesses seven or eight years, but that was merely a coincidence. He didn't call it a particularly curious coincidence. Most coincidences were curious. Neither did he call it a curious coincidence that true patriotism was his only motive, too. He was a true Briton, and hoped there were many like him. The blue flies buzzed again, and Mr. Attorney General called Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Mr. Jarvis Lorry, are you a clerk in Telson's bank? I am. On a certain Friday night in November 1775, did business occasion you to travel between London and Dover by the mail? It did. Were there any other passengers in the mail? Two. Did they alight on the road in the course of the night? They did. Mr. Lorry, look upon the prisoner. Was he one of those two passengers? I cannot undertake to say that he was. Does he resemble either of these two passengers? Both were so wrapped up, and the night was so dark, and we were all so reserved, that I cannot undertake to say even that. 
Mr. Lorry, look upon the prisoner. Supposing him wrapped up as those two passengers were, is there anything in his bulk and stature to render it unlikely that he was one of them? No. You will not swear, Mr. Lorry, that he was not one of them? No. So at least you say he may have been one of them? Yes, except that I remember them both to have been, like myself, timorous of highwaymen, and the prisoner has not a timorous air. Did you ever see a counterfeit of timidity, Mr. Lorry? I certainly have seen that. Mr. Lorry, look upon the prisoner once more. Have you seen him to your certain knowledge before? I have. When? I was returning from France a few days afterwards, and at Calais the prisoner came aboard the packet-ship in which I returned and made the voyage with me. At what hour did he come on board? At a little after midnight. In the dead of night. Was he the only passenger who came on board at that untimely hour? He happened to be the only one. Never mind about happening, Mr. Lorry. He was the only passenger who came on board in the dead of night? He was. Were you traveling alone, Mr. Lorry, or with any companion? With two companions, a gentleman and a lady. They are here. They are here. Had you any conversation with the prisoner? Hardly any. The weather was stormy, and the passage long and rough, and I lay on a sofa almost from shore to shore. Miss Manette, the young lady to whom all eyes had been turned before, and were now turned again, stood up where she had sat. Her father rose with her and kept her hand drawn through his arm. Miss Manette, look upon the prisoner. To be confronted with such pity, and such earnest youth and beauty was far more trying to the accused than to be confronted with all the crowd. Standing, as it were, apart with her on the edge of his grave, not all the staring curiosity that looked on could for the moment nerve him to remain quite still. His hurried right hand parceled out the herbs before him into imaginary beds of flowers in a garden, and his efforts to control and steady his breathing shook the lips from which the color rushed to his heart. The buzz of the great flies was loud again. Miss Manette, have you seen the prisoner before? Yes, sir. Where? On board the packet ship just now referred to, sir, and on the same occasion. You are the young lady just now referred to? Oh, most unhappily I am. The plaintive tone of her compassion merged into the less musical voice of the judge, as he said something fiercely. Answer the questions put to you, and make no remark upon them. Miss Manette, had you any conversation with the prisoner on that passage across the channel? Yes, sir. Recall it. In the midst of a profound stillness she faintly began, When the gentleman came on board— Do you mean the prisoner? inquired the judge, knitting his brows. Yes, my lord. Then say the prisoner. When the prisoner came on board, he noticed that my father, turning her eyes lovingly to him as he stood beside her, was much fatigued and in a very weak state of health. My father was so reduced that I was afraid to take him out of the air, and I had made a bed for him on the deck near the cabin steps and I sat on the deck at his side to take care of him. There were no other passengers that night but we four. The prisoner was so good as to beg permission to advise me how I could shelter my father from the wind and the weather better than I had done. I had not known how to do it well, 
not understanding how the wind would set when we were out of the harbor. He did it for me. He expressed great kindness, and kindness for my father's state, and I'm sure he felt it. That was the manner of our beginning to speak together. Let me interrupt you a moment. Had he come on board alone? No. How many were with him? Two French gentlemen. Had they conferred together? They had conferred together until the last moment, when it was necessary for the French gentlemen to be landed in their boat. Had any papers been handed about among them, similar to these lists? Some papers were handed among them, but I don't know what papers. Like these, in shape and size? Possibly, but indeed I don't know although they stood whispering very near to me, because they stood at the top of the cabin steps to have the light of the lamp that was hanging there. It was a dull lamp, and they spoke very low, and I did not hear what they said, and saw only that they looked at papers. Now on to the prisoner's conversation, Miss Manette. The prisoner was as open as in his confidence with me, which arose out of my helpless situation and he was kind and good and useful to my father. I hope, bursting into tears, I may not repay him by doing him harm to-day. Buzzing from the blue flies. Miss Manette, if the prisoner does not perfectly understand that you give evidence which it is your duty to give, which you must give, and which you cannot escape from giving, with great unwillingness, he is the only person present in that condition. Please to go on. He told me that he was travelling on business of a delicate and difficult nature, which might get people into trouble, and that he was therefore travelling under an assumed name. He said that his business had, within a few days, taken him to France, and might at intervals take him backwards and forwards between France and England for a long time to come. Did he say anything about America, Miss Manette? Be particular. He tried to explain to me how that quarrel had arisen, and he had said that, so far as he could judge, it was a wrong and foolish one on England's part. He added in a jesting way that perhaps George Washington might gain almost as great a name in history as George the Third, But there was no harm in his way of saying this. It was said laughingly and to beguile the time. Any strongly marked expression of face on the part of a chief actor in a scene of great interest, to whom all eyes are directed, will be unconsciously imitated by the spectators. Her forehead was painfully anxious and intent as she gave this evidence, and in the pauses when she stopped for the judge to write it down, watched its effect upon the council for and against. Among the lookers-on there was the same expression in all quarters of the court, insomuch that a great majority of the foreheads there might have been mirrors reflecting the witness, when the judge, looking up from his notes to glare at that tremendous heresy at George Washington. Mr. Attorney General now signified to my lord that he deemed it necessary, as a matter of precaution and form, to call the young lady's father, Dr. Manette, who was called accordingly. Dr. Manette, look upon the prisoner. Have you seen him before? Once, when he called at my lodgings in London, some three years or three and a half years ago. Can you identify him as your fellow passenger on board the packet, or speak to his conversation with your daughter? Sir, I can do neither. Is there any particular and special reason for your being unable to do either? He answered in a low voice. There is. Has it been your misfortune to undergo a long imprisonment without trial, or even accusation in your native country, Dr. Manette? 
he answered in a tone that went to every heart, A long imprisonment. Were you newly released on the occasion in question? They tell me so. Have you no remembrance of the occasion? None. My mind is a blank. From some time, I cannot even say what time, when I employed myself in my captivity in making shoes, to the time when I found myself living in London with my dear daughter here. She had become familiar to me when a gracious God restored my faculties, but I am quite unable even to say how she had become familiar. I have no remembrance of the process. Mr. Attorney General sat down, and the father and daughter sat down together. A singular circumstance then arose in the case, the object in hand being to show that the prisoner went down with some fellow plotter untracked in the Dover Mail on that Friday night in November five years ago, and had got out of the mail in the night as a blind at some place where he did not remain, but from which he travelled back some dozen miles or more to a garrison and dockyard, and there collected information. A witness was called to identify him as having been at the precise time required in the coffee-room of an hotel in that garrison and dockyard town waiting for another person. The prisoner's counsel was cross-examining the witness with no result, except that he had never seen the prisoner on any other occasion, when the wigged gentleman, who had all this time been looking up at the ceiling of the court, wrote a word or two on a little piece of paper, screwed it up, and tossed it to him. Opening this piece of paper in the next pause, the counsel looked with great attention and curiosity at the prisoner. You say again you are quite sure it was the prisoner? The witness was quite sure. Did you ever see anybody very like the prisoner? Not so like, the witness said, as that he could be mistaken. Look well upon that gentleman, my learned friend there, pointing to him who had tossed the paper over, and then look well upon the prisoner. How say you? Are they very like each other? Allowing for my learned friend's appearance being careless and slovenly, if not debauched, they were sufficiently like each other to surprise not only the witness, but everybody present when they were thus brought into comparison. My lord, being prayed to bid my learned friend lay aside his wig, and giving no very gracious consent, the likeness became more remarkable. My lord inquired of Mr. Stryver, the prisoner's counsel, whether they were next to try Mr. Carton, the name of my learned friend, for treason. Mr. Stryver replied to my lord no, but that he would ask the witness to tell him whether what had happened once might happen twice, whether he could have been so confident if he had seen this illustration of his rashness sooner whether he would be so confident having seen it and more, the upshot of which was to smash this witness like a crockery vessel, and shiver his part of the case to useless lumber. Mr. Cruncher had by this time taken quite a lunch of rust off his fingers in the following of the evidence. He had now to attend while Mr. Stryver fitted the prisoner's case on the jury, like a compact suit of clothes, showing them how the patriot Barsad was a hired spy and traitor, an unblushing trafficker in blood, and one of the greatest scoundrels upon the earth since the cursed Judas, which he certainly did look rather like, how the virtuous servant Cly was his friend and partner, and was worthy to be, how watchful eyes of these forgers and false swearers had rested upon the prisoner as a victim, 
because some family affairs in France, he being of French extraction, did require his making those passages across the channel, though what those affairs were, a consideration for others who were near and dear to him, forbade him, even for his life, to disclose. How the evidence that had been warped and wrested from the young lady, whose anguish in giving it they had witnessed, come to nothing, involving the mere little innocent gallantries and politenesses likely to pass between any young gentleman and young lady so thrown together, with the exception of that reference to George Washington, which was altogether too extravagant and impossible to regard in any light other than as a monstrous joke, how it would be a weakness in the government to break down in this attempt to practice for popularity on the lowest national antipathies and fears, and therefore Mr. Attorney General had made the most of it, how nevertheless it rested upon nothing, save that vile and infamous character of evidence too often disfiguring such cases, and of which state trials in this country were full. But there my lord interposed, with as grave a face as if it had not been true, saying that he could not sit upon that bench and suffer those illusions. Mr. Stryver then called his few witnesses, and Mr. Cruncher had next to attend, while Mr. Attorney General turned the whole suit of clothes Mr. Stryver had fitted on the jury inside out, showing how Barsad and Clive were even a hundred times better than he had thought them, and that the prisoner a hundred times worse. Lastly came my lord himself, turning the suit of clothes, now inside out, now outside in, but on the whole, decidedly trimming and shaping them into grave clothes for the prisoner. And now the jury turned to consider, and the great flies swarmed again. Mr. Carton, who had so long sat looking at the ceiling of the court, changed neither his place nor his attitude, even in this excitement, while his teamed friend, Mr. Stryver, messing his papers before him, whispered with those who sat near, and from time to time glanced anxiously at the jury, while all the spectators moved, more or less, and grouped themselves anew, while even my lord himself rose from his seat, and slowly paced up and down his platform, not unattended by a suspicion in the minds of the audience that his state was feverish. This one man sat leaning back with his torn gown half off him, his untidy wig put on just as it happened to fight on his head after its removal, his hands in his pockets, and his eyes on the ceiling as they had been all day. Something especially reckless in his demeanor not only gave him a disreputable look, but so diminished the strong resemblance he undoubtedly bore to the prisoner, which his momentary earnestness, when they were compared together, had strengthened, that many of the lookers-on, taking note of him now, said to one another that they would hardly have thought the two were so alike. Mr. Cruncher made the observation to his next neighbor, and added, "'I don't have a guinea that he doesn't have no law work to do. Doesn't he doesn't look like the sort of one to get any, do he?' Yet this Mr. Carton took in more of the details of the scene than he appeared to take in, for now, when Miss Manette's head dropped upon her father's breast, he was the first to see it, and to say audibly, "'Officer, look to that young lady. Help the gentleman to take her out. Don't you see she will fall?' There was much commiseration for her as she was removed, and much sympathy with her father. It had evidently been a great distress to him to have the days of his imprisonment recalled. He had shown strong internal agitation when he was questioned, and that pondering or brooding look which made him old had been upon him like a heavy cloud ever since. As he passed out, the jury, who had turned back and paused a moment, spoke through their foreman. They were not agreed, and wished to retire. My lord, perhaps with George Washington on his mind, showed some surprise that they were not agreed. 
but signified his pleasure that they should retire under watch and ward, and retired himself. The trial had lasted all day, and the lamps in the court were now being lighted. It began to be rumored that the jury would be out a long while. The spectators dropped off to get refreshment, and the prisoner withdrew to the back of the dock, and sat down. Mr. Lorry, who had gone out when the young lady and her father went out, now reappeared and beckoned to Jerry, who, in the slackened interest, could easily get near him. "'Jerry, if you wish to take something to eat, you can, but keep in the way. You will be sure to hear when the jury come in. Don't be a moment behind them, for I want you to take the verdict back to the bank. You are the quickest messenger I know, and will get to Temple Bar long before I can.' Jerry had just enough forehead to knuckle, and he knuckled it in acknowledgment of this communication and a shilling. Mr. Carton came up at that moment and touched Mr. Lorry on the arm. "'How is the young lady?' "'She is greatly distressed, but her father is comforting her, and she feels better for being out of court.' "'I'll tell the prisoner so. It wouldn't do for a respectable bank gentleman like you to be seen speaking to him publicly, you know.' Mr. Lorry reddened as if he were conscious of having debated the point in his mind, and Mr. Carton made his way outside of the bar. The way out of court lay in that direction, and Jerry followed him, all eyes, ears, and spikes. "'Mr. Darnay,' the prisoner came forward directly, "'you will naturally be anxious to hear of the witness, Miss Manette. She will do very well. You have seen the worst of her agitation.' I am deeply sorry to have been the cause of it. Could you tell her so for me with my fervent acknowledgments? Yes, I could. I will, if you ask it. Mr. Carton's manner was so careless as to be almost insolent. He stood half-turned from the prisoner, lounging with his elbow against the bar. I do ask it. Accept my cordial thanks. What? said Carton, still only half-turned toward him. Do you expect, Mr. Darnay? The worst. That is the wisest thing to expect, and the likeliest. But I think their withdrawing is in your favor. Loitering on the way out of court not being allowed, Jerry heard no more, but left them, so like each other in feature, so unlike each other in manner, standing side by side, both reflected in the glass above them. An hour and a half limped heavily away in the thief and rascal crowded passages below, even though assisted off with mutton pies and ale. The horse messenger, uncomfortably seated on a form after taking that refraction, had dropped into a doze, with a loud murmur and a rapid tide of people setting up the stairs that led to the court, carried him along with them. Jerry. Jerry, Mr. Lorry, was already calling at the door when he got there. Here, sir, it's a fight to get back again. Here I am, sir. Mr. Lorry handed him a paper through the throng. Quick, have you got it? Yes, sir. Hastily written on the paper was the word, Acquitted. If you had sent the message recalled to life again, muttered Jerry as he turned, I should have known what you meant this time. He had no opportunity of saying, or so much as thinking, anything else, until he was clear of the old bailey, for the crowd came pouring out with a vehemence that nearly took him off his legs, and a loud buzz swept into the street, as if the baffled blue flies were dispersing in search of other carrion. Thus ends Book Two, Chapter Three. A disappointment.